Eleven and down. Eleven and down. So our question this morning, if you peeked in your bulletin, was does God wear rose-colored glasses? Um, some of you are probably familiar with this phrase, does rose-colored glasses? People, if you know anyone that wears rose-colored glasses, maybe you wear rose-colored glasses. Um, but for those of you that don't know what this phrase means, I've written it up here for you. And I want you to focus on the bottom half. It says, it's an optimistic perception of something, a positive opinion, seeing something in a positive way, and here's the catch, often thinking of it as better than it actually is. Um, some people by their personality are just very optimistic people. Everything is wonderful. It's always going to work out in the end. Um, and it's fun to be around those people because they never tear you down. They're always building you up. They're always encouraging. They always have a smile on their face. Um, it's usually the, the Debbie Downer or the negative Nancy or people like that, the frowning Fred who uh, you don't want to be around too often because they're always finding something negative to talk about. Before you know it, you're feeling crummy like that. Um, but people with rose-colored glasses tend to be very optimistic in the way they see things, oftentimes giving or thinking of something better than it actually is. And I, I bring this up because our question had to do with, with God. Does, does God wear rose-colored glasses when he looks at you as a child of God? Does he see you better or does he have a, a greater positive opinion than what you really are? Um, is he filtering you with these rose-colored glasses, or are you as awesome as the Bible says you are? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, we want to find out today about how you see us. Do you have a special pair of glasses that you wear to make us look better than what we really are? Or are we as good as the Bible says we are? Are we as good as and righteous and justified and sanctified and accepted and loved and, and beloved as you say we are? Lord, teach us this morning. Let us uh, grab hold of the truth of the scripture and let us not let go of who you say we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to look at a few verses this morning uh, that kind of talk about our righteousness. And then one verse that kind of throws us for a loop. It was written by Paul, and he claimed to be something. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says this, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who do no sin, talking about Jesus. Look at this, that we, okay, those of us who accept Jesus, that we, might be made the righteousness of God in him. So you ask the question, how righteous is God? You're like, he's as righteous as righteous can get. And this verse tells us that we have been made the righteousness of God through Jesus. Wow. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, God's righteous. I don't know about that righteous. Well, that's what the Bible just said. You're looking at it. Let's look at some more. 1 John 3, 7, little children, let no man deceive you. Let no man trick you. Let no man pull the wool over your eye. He that doeth righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. The only way that we can do righteousness is if or because he's righteous. We're in him and he's in us and we have become one with God. And that's the only way. You can do righteousness. You cannot do righteousness apart from God. You can fake it, and you might trick some other people, but you're not tricking God. Either God's in you, and you can do righteousness, or he's not in you, and you can not do righteousness, period. This is what First John's telling us. And then, and then the, the, the spinner that Paul gives us, when he claims something about his, his life, in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Here Paul is saying, you know, um, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and 
I am the worst sinner that ever was. Did you ever get around people that uh, start sharing stories? You know, and when I was a kid, teenager, it was the bragging stories. You know, we talk about the worst thing we ever did. And then the next guy said, well, that ain't nothing. This is what I did. And he'd try to one-up you. And then the next guy said, yeah, well, I burned down a whole city. And then, you know, wow, that's worse than what we did. And then someone had to talk that guy, I burned down the whole world, you know, kind of deal. And on and on the stories we go. Well, Paul is saying, listen, uh, if you think you're a bad sinner, I'm the chief of sinners. I was the worst that ever was. And in Christianity, there's sometimes uh, what's called the dirty worm theory, that we're all dirty worms and Jesus just, you know, cleaned us up, but we're still a dirty worm. We still think like a dirty worm. And oftentimes they use this verse to try to support that. See, look, even Paul, the, the great apostle, the great evangelist, the great church planner, he even said that he's a dirty, dirty, rotten sinner. So shouldn't we go around saying the same? Stay tuned. We'll find out. When we are talking about our righteousness, how righteous is a, a saved person of God? There's a couple questions we need to ask ourselves um, and find, obviously, the answers in the Bible. Um, and the way that we answer these two questions is going to be critical. It's going to be imperative to how we see ourselves and how we see God relating to us. How does God relate to us? How does he look at us? Does he have to put on rose-colored glasses when he looks at us? Or does he really see us as or for what we are in him. Is our righteousness real or fake? Are we really righteous, or is it a pseudo-righteousness? Is it a quasi-righteousness? Yeah, you're righteous, but it's not really your righteousness. It's, it's God's. Is it, is it imparted righteousness? Is it shared, or is it just credited to an account somewhere that you can't see yet? right? We're, we're storing treasures in heaven. Have you seen those treasures? No, but I'm hoping that they're there. So this is this mystic heavenly accounting book that you're really not righteous. Yeah, you've trusted Christ. Yes, you've experienced transformational life, but you're really not righteous. You're just credited righteous. It's not yours yet until you get to heaven. Then you can get hold of those treasures. A lot of people talked about righteousness in that way. It's not real righteousness. It's kind of a, it's there, but it's, it's not available to you yet. It's an asset you can't touch. It's like it's in a trust, right? It's in a trust fund, and you can't touch it until you're in heaven. Okay? You can dream about it, think about it, uh, but you really can't experience the righteousness of God. So how we answer these two questions is very, very important. Is it just imputed righteousness, or is it really imparted? Do we really share in the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Well, when I was a, a young kid, a teenager, I went to a, a camp um, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was at a university called Philadelphia College of Bible, um, and it had switched a couple names before that, and now it's called something else. But as one of their going away gifts, marketing, I called it, uh, they gave you a shirt. And I had this shirt that had Romans 6.18 quoted on it. It says this, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. This, was a, this is a verse in Romans talking about our life before we came to Christ and then our transformation after we came to Christ. And what it's saying is that we were have being then made free from sin. When we got saved, we were set free. The chains fell off, and no longer were we servants of sin or slaves of sin. Think about that. A slave, it's not an option. They're forced to do this. They can't think for themselves. They have to do what their master tells them to do. They really have no independence and independency uh, or decision-making apart from what their master says. And our master was Satan himself and sin. And we were a slave to it. No matter what we did, it had his name attached to it. And then it says, 
Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. We changed. We became free. And now we serve a risen Savior. We serve God himself. So the question then, how real, okay, if we want to know how real our righteousness is, how real was our slavery to sin? Was it, were you really a slave to sin or was it just fake? You know, you really didn't have to serve Satan unless you wanted to. Was it a real slavery or was it a fake slavery? It was real. It was real. So if our slavery to, slavery to sin was real, how real is your righteousness in Christ? I'm going to say it's just as real as your slavery to sin was. It's very real. See, before we knew Christ, we were dead to God, the Bible tells us, and alive to sin. That's what we live for. We got up every day. How can I sin more? How can I live for me? How can I throw everyone else under the bus and take what's mine and what I deserve? And then the Bible tells us that now, because of Christ, we've been made dead to sin, and now we're alive to God. Our spirit has been born towards God. We actually want to do what God wants now. We're on the same team. We desire to do the will of God. Because we're now dead to sin. It's no longer our master. We got a new master. It's Jesus himself. So our righteousness is just as real as our slavery to sin was. But that's usually not what we've heard through the years. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you might have heard something very different about your righteousness and your experience with righteousness. Well, when God looks at you, he's really not looking at you. He's looking at you through a Jesus filter. And that Jesus filter takes all that nastiness away from you. And then God, God just sees the good parts of you. Thank goodness God has a Jesus, Jesus filter. Aren't you happy for Jesus filters today? And we hear all that kind of stuff. You might have heard that, well, he's not really seeing you. He doesn't see you anymore. He just sees Jesus in you. And that's why God rejoices, because you're still nasty. You're still dirty and scarred and sinful. So thank goodness there's some Jesus in you, because there wasn't any Jesus in you God couldn't look at yet. You might have heard that. Or God's pulling the wool over his own eyes. God's fakes himself out. He just imagines seeing Jesus and not you, because God's really excited about deceiving himself. Um, so God's not really looking at us, et cetera, et cetera. You might have heard something along that genre, but none of it is true. Not one thing that I just said about what you may have heard over years is true. This is what the Bible says about your righteousness. 1 Peter 3, 2, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. God's not having to look through you through some filter. His eyes are looking right at the righteous. He's looking. His eyes are on his children. Whenever I go to a, a large park and take my kids there, um, and there are kids running everywhere, my eyes are on my kids. If the park's empty, I'm not watching my kids until I hear a crock, right, and a broken bone. All right, now we'll go to the hospital, park hospital. Then we'll go out and get some ice cream, right? That's, that's the normal thing, right? It's what you do. But when you're in a strange place and there's a lot of possible people that would do harm to your kids, your eyes are on your kids. And this verse is telling us that God's eyes are on us. He's not looking at anything else. He's not looking at us through filters. It says that his eyes are on us and his ears are open to our prayers. He wants to know what's going on in our life. God is always looking at us. And he's not using some filter. In Romans chapter 4, verse 24, it says this about our righteousness. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now, there's two types of righteousness. This is where the theologians start to get dicey. They 
talk about in imputed righteousness, and then they talk about imparted righteousness. Imputed means credited. Okay? It's someone credited your account. Um, wasn't necessarily your money or, or your sacrifice. Um, they did it for you. They, they credited your account. Um, and then there's an imported, but here, here it talks about imputed. And it's true. Part of our righteousness, our righteousness definitely wasn't something that we deserve. Christ gave it to us, imparted it, credited it to us. But too many scholars muddy the waters when teaching about righteousness, saying that it's credited. It's not really yours. It's been placed in your heavenly account, but it's not yet attainable until you get to heaven. They say that you're on some type of a, a scale or a balance, and here's you on one side, and here's Jesus on the other, and to God, you weigh as much as Jesus. You're as, as valuable as Jesus, and, and really, that's your righteousness. It's not your own. You're on this balance with Jesus. Or they'll say, your righteousness, well, it's really not your righteousness. You're righteous in Christ, and they usually throw those big giant quotations up. You're righteous in Christ, wink, wink, nod, nod. Say, in Christ, yeah, you're righteous, but you're not really righteous. But in Christ, yeah, you're righteous. And it makes you and me, or it implies that you and I cannot experience righteousness on planet Earth, that it's not really ours, that it's, it's not available to us, that we can't experience righteousness right now. It is true that we are equally valuable to God as Jesus is valuable to God. And it's also true that we've been credited Jesus' righteousness, but there's so much more. There's so much more to learn about our righteousness, more so than it just being imputed. We have been spiritually reborn. And that's the picture of water baptism. It's a picture of what happened to us the moment we trusted Jesus Christ. We were reborn. We were raised to new life. We participated in Christ's death and his burial and resurrection. And when we resurrected with Christ, we resurrected to a brand new life. Something awesome at our core has been transformed. We went through a supernatural surgery where sin, the body of sin, was cut out so that God could be placed within. It's supernatural. My relatives live in California, and my aunt's neighbor was a surfer dude, and he gave my aunt all of his old outfits, his old t-shirts and shorts, and she put them in a big old box and shipped them out to Pennsylvania, and I had all these cool surfer shirts with little palm trees on, emblems, and all kinds of cool stuff. And my friends at school say, where do you get these shirts? I'm like, I can't tell. <laughs> I'm not going to get them at the local mall in Pennsylvania, because we don't even sell surfboards in Pennsylvania. Maybe somewhere they do. Anyway, um, surfer dudes have their own language, right? I mean, they got their own lingo. If you get around them, they're throwing things out. It's like being around someone in the military. They got all these acronyms. You're like, what the what? Where are you going and where? You're like, so you got to figure things out. Surfer dudes are the same way, right? But surfer dudes claim that once you catch a killer wave, you will be transformed. You will, you'll see life in a totally different way, man, when you catch that first wave and you ride it all the way to the end. Just like we've been transformed by Christ, it alters the way we see the world forevermore. You will never be the same again because now you've experienced Jesus Christ. You're in the know. You're in the know. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, look what it says about what we experience. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness 
is born of him. Now in the movie Nemo, there was this cool Australian turtle man, and his name was Crush. And his favorite phrase was, righteous, whoa, because he would catch this incredible current in the ocean. And he was like a surfer turtle, okay? Well, as Christians, we have the very righteousness of God in us, and it's now ours. And we really should be going around all day saying, righteous, because we are. Because we have experienced something, and once you've experienced, it'll change you. You'll see things like you've never seen them before. We can practice righteousness because we, or we, are born of God. It's not just a place value on us. It's not just a weight. It involved our putting off of our old self and a rebirth of a new self, a righteous self. We're no longer slaves to sin. We have become servants of righteousness. And now you and I are righteous. We are now a partaker. It's a shared righteousness. It's not credited, although it is. It is also shared. Christ shared his very righteousness with you and me, and that is something that we can experience right now. We do not have to wait till we get to heaven. Uh, righteousness is something we experience right now. We are partakers. It is imparted. He imparted his very life to us, and righteousness is part of Christ's very character, which he has given to you as a gift. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4, says this about our righteousness. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers. That's sharing. He has literally shared with us his very character. Of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Folks, it's real. Now, you might not always feel like it's real from day to day. There's days when you feel that God is a million miles away, but he's not. The Bible tells us that he sticks closer than a brother. He is literally living inside of you. He's not far at all. Your feelings will betray you, but the truth never will. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, period. He meant it. He can't lie. He's not a man that he can lie, the Bible says. So he's not going anywhere, but your feelings will betray you. That's when you've got to put your feelings over in the corner, tell them to have a time out, and then you read your Bible, and you read the truth. Okay, God, you say you're with me. You say you're never going to leave me. You say that nothing will separate you from me. I can never mess this up, so I have to believe that you're right here. And you stand on that truth until you believe it. Until they come in alignment, your feelings say, okay, I feel now that God's with me after reading over and over again the truth that he's in me. Amen? Amen. Your righteousness is very, very real. But I don't feel righteous. That's fine. You don't have to feel righteous. The truth is you still are. I don't, I don't care. Your feelings, your feelings uh, uh, have nothing to do with facts a lot of the time. Amen. Fact is, God loves you. Fact is, you're righteous, and your feelings, until they get in alignment with facts, help them to go sit in the corner. So, has this ever happened before in the Bible? Absolutely. Let's go back to Paul for a moment. Paul, the great apostle. Uh, Paul, the incredible church planner. Paul, the guy that wrote pretty much the entire New Testament. Um, Paul started a lot of churches. And until he got back around to revisit the churches that he started, he found out that they were uh, doing some things very, very wrong. But Paul tells us in Galatians that it is given, that our righteousness is imparted. In Galatians 3.21, it says this, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, and that word given is imparted, if the law could impart life, 
If we could have gotten saved by keeping the law, we would have needed Jesus. We would just keep the law and everyone would be saved, right? How simple is that? If it could have given life, but he said it couldn't. If the law could have given, which could have given life, barely righteousness should have been by the law. We could have attained righteousness by doing good. I'm a good person. I deserve to go to heaven. But it never could do that because no one could ever keep the law in the perfection that it demanded. So Christ had to come. And through Christ, we obtained righteousness. So look at Paul's train of thought here. Paul teaches that we trusted Christ. And when we did that, not only did we receive eternal life, which is usually how most of us that come to Christ in a young age, we don't want to go to hell. We wanted eternal life. Yes, I believe in God. But not only did we get eternal life, we also received his righteousness. His very righteousness. That's Paul's train of thought. So let's look at it a little bit closer in some other places in our Bible. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of the Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. His life saved us. When we got his life, we got his righteousness as well. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, the life figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, we were saved by his life, not relating to us as if we're righteous, but he relates to us now because we are righteous. Very important distinction we have to understand. Not as if you're righteous, he relates to you now because you are righteous. The very righteousness of Jesus Christ given to each and every one of you, and that's how God can talk to you. That's how God can live inside of you. That's how you were reconciled. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. My daughter Mercy said the other day, she goes, I'm going to be sad to go to heaven because we're not going to eat meat in heaven. So we were eating a lot of barbecue the last few days. She's like worried that we're not going to have barbecue in heaven. I, I wanted to share with this verse with her. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That verse is really talking about a sweet-smelling savor, the righteousness of God. Another place the Bible talks about a sweet-smelling savor. And it goes back to the sacrifices in the temple. And they were cooking, cooking meat on the grill. And God said, it smells good to me. It smells good to me. So I'm hoping, I told my little girl, I said, maybe they'll have an impossible burger for us in heaven. It'll taste so good. It's like you're eating meat. But he's made him, for he hath made him to be sin for us in us, and that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If we're so righteous, we have to believe it. So then why did Paul in 1 Timothy tell us that he's the chief of sinners? Why did he, why did he, see there's the sweet smelling savor verse. See that? It's not awesome. He's not going to barbecue us. What he's saying is, we smell good to him. Yeah, like, turns out. Glad we're not going to be barbecued in heaven. It's been a bummer. Uh, but it's sweet because we have the righteousness of God. That's, that's a good smelling smell to God because we are just as righteous as Christ is. But Paul then tells us that he's the chief of sinners. I'm the worst sinner that ever was. I want you guys to realize that this is just a reference to how Paul was before he was transformed. Before he came to Christ, Paul was a nasty dude, not a nice guy. Um, his life's, life's uh, mission was to persecute Christians and to participate in their murder. He didn't like Christians. He was a very devout Jew. Uh, Christians were, were not uh, friendly people. And he is basically saying that this is the way I was before I came to Christ. I was a sinner for sure. To prove it, gives, the Bible gives examples. In Acts 22:20 20 says this, 
And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, he admits here, I also was standing by and consenting to his death. In fact, I even held the clothes of those that were thrown. Here, give me your heavy cloak so you can get a good swing on that rock and nail Stephen really hard. He wasn't, he wasn't saying, stop it, we'll put your rocks down. This man needs to have a, a, a real trial. He's like, get him and hit him good. Here, let me let me hold your outfit. In fact, I, there's a nice big rock over there that'll you know, fly through the air good. He was actively participating in the murder of Christians. And he admitted that. He admitted that. In, in uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, he says it again. For you have heard of my conversation. You've heard of my former life. In times past, in the Jewish religion, how that beyond measure... I took it to the nth degree. I wasn't a fanatic. I was a super fanatic, and I persecuted the church of God, and I did it. I destroyed everything. I completely wasted whatever I saw. Just didn't kill the men, the women and the children, and the dogs and the cats, too. Wasted it all. When Paul says that he is the chief of sinners, he's simply saying that he's grateful to God for his grace and mercy. If God can forgive a nasty person like me, he can forgive you. Paul's one up in you. You ever get around somebody and you're witnessing to him and they say, I, I don't know if God could ever forgive a person like me. I've been bad for a long time. I've done stuff I don't even want to tell you what I've done. I've heard them all. I heard every line in the book. I don't know if God has enough for a person like me, enough forgiveness. I don't, I don't think his love could cover my multitude of sins. And Paul's basically saying, listen, you think you're bad? Look what I used to do. Let me tell you what I used to do. And probably after Paul got done telling them all the gory stuff that he did, they're probably like, all right, yeah, okay, you win. You are definitely worse than I am. And if God can forgive you, I guess he can forgive me too. And that was Paul's whole point. Listen, God's forgiven me, and I'm so grateful and thankful for God for his grace and mercy. You can be grateful, too, if you place your faith in him. He will forgive you just like he forgave me. I didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. But he loves us anyway. He loves us anyway. Like Paul, we were also participants in the death, burial, and resurrection of our old self. Paul had to die just like you did. His old self had to die, and then he was raised to a new self, a new person. And God has made us new through the resurrection of the Son, Jesus Christ. God desires that you and I see ourselves as a new self and not in our old self. I'll say that again. God desires that you and I see ourselves as our new self and not as our old self. Why did Jesus come? So that you could continue to walk around thinking about your old self? He came and died on the cross so that you would see yourself as a new self, a righteous self. So Paul started a lot of churches, and they got a lot of things wrong early and often. So he came around, he addressed them through letters in person. Let's look what he did. When he talked to the early church, these are born-again believers just like you and me, messing up still. Um, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, they were trying to achieve maturity of their Christian faith by legalism. They were trying to go back to the law to achieve a greater spiritual maturity. You're a Christian, yeah, 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 but you probably should go get circumcised. And you probably should stop eating that. You should probably stop going over there. And all of a sudden, they created a quick list of what a person should do and shouldn't do. And if you do all the things on the list, you're a, more of a super Christian than the person who isn't doing it. And we got modern day lists today as well. We make our own up. 
and then we hold people accountable. Well, you know, I saw them over at that place, and you know, I heard a, a curse word slip out of that guy's mouth. I don't know about him. You know, he says he's a Christian, but you know, and then they got the kids over here doing their that thing. You know, those crazy teenagers. They're not. Their house isn't in order, and on and on we got all these great lists. And that's how we determine someone's righteousness. But anyway, the Galatians were looking to legalism to advance their spiritual growth. And then in the Corinthians and 1 Corinthians, they were trying to make water baptism some type of a, a marker. Who, who baptized you? Oh, just Pastor Aaron baptized you? Well, uh, that's not very good. I got baptized by Billy Graham. Now, that was a heck of a baptism right there. I'll tell you what. My baptism is much greater than Pastor Aaron's baptism because, you know, Billy Graham and then, you know, and on and on they went, but who baptized who? And that was all of a sudden a, a sign of a, a greater, more spiritual Christian. And then, of course, we also read that the Corinthians were totally trashing the Lord's Supper. Uh, people were getting there early, eating all, eating all the food and drinking all the wine, so much so that they went into a, a turkey nap um, before the service even started. You know, and getting drunk and, and dying, the Bible even says. I mean, they were totally trashing the Lord's Supper, not honoring it and sharing as the way God made it. Yet, when Paul was addressing all three of these simple examples, not once did he ever degrade them and call them dirty, nasty worms. Not once did he call them sinners and, and you know, old, nasty people that don't know how to live for Jesus. Every time he addressed them, he called them saints. Never once did he say, you're bad, you're nasty. He said, dear saints in Christ. That was a word that built people up. It was a word that brought people who maybe have been messing up. It brought them back to where they really are. Set apart. A child of God. He always addressed them for who they were and not for how they were behaving mom and dad grandparents when your grandkids or children mess up address them for who they are in christ and not how they're behaving you're bad you're a bad boy you're a bad girl hold on a second let's think about that for a moment are they bad or are they behaving bad? There's a huge difference. As Christians, we get saved. We get the very righteousness of God placed inside of us. It's real. And you can experience it now. Do Christians still sin? Yeah. We still mess up. But we're not bad at the core. We are now saints... Who sometimes sin. I'm going to say that again. We are saints who sometimes sin. Sinning is not our nature anymore. We have been set free from sin. Now we're alive to God. We've been set free from sin and now we're slaves to righteousness. That has been a transformation not done by us, but done by God himself in our spiritual core. You are a saint. A few moments ago, you weren't acting like one. Acting. You weren't behaving. You weren't performing as if you were. And maybe it's because right now you're not thinking about your righteousness. Right now, you're probably having a little pity party about how you can't do anything right and how you've broken all your promises to God, and how could God love you even after you promised not to do it again, and then you went out and did it again. And you're having a little beat myself up party. God doesn't love me anymore. How could he love someone like me? He's given me so many chances, and I can't get it right. Right comes from the word righteousness. You got his righteousness. You're as right as right can get at the core. Now, if you believe that, guess what you might be able to do? You might be actually be able to believe and behave as if you're right. Instead of walking around all day thinking that you're a dirty worm and nasty and dirty, you've got all these ugly scars and how could God love you? 
He loves you. He loves you because it's real. So you and I are not very different from the early church believers. We still sin after our conversion. Yet, you and I are not the sum total of what we do. Aren't you glad? Well, Aaron, if you would see my most recent track record, Christian would be the last thing you'd call me. You are not the sum total of what you do. You are who you are by birth. You are who you are by birth. That's why you had to be born again. What does your birth certificate say? You pull out your spiritual birth certificate, it says right on it, child of God. And at the bottom, never expires, unchangeable, unrevocable. But I, but I don't identify as a Christian. I want to be something else today. Well, you can act like whatever you want to act like, but at the core, you're God's. He locked it and threw away the key. You can't go back. So you may look like you're not a Christian. You may act like you're not a Christian. But the moment that you got saved, you became a Christian. Because it says so on your spiritual birth certificate. The birth certificate that you used to have said, Son of Adam, slave to Satan, slave to sin, dead to God. That birth certificate got cut up. Not just a hole punch in it, like Pen Dot will do for you when you get a new one. It was cut up, burnt, gone, it's dead and in the ground. And your new birth certificate, I mean, my wife just got a new license. Um, and it's always fun to see what you look like five years ago, right? <laughs> she looks good. She looks good on this, on this license. Um, but we don't have an old, old birth certificate to go back to. It's gone. That old man is dead in the ground, and you only have your new identity. And your new identity says that you are righteous. You are not the sum total of what you do. You are not sinners by nature anymore. By nature, you are saints who sometimes sin. And our righteousness is real because we have been reborn of God. Finish with this verse from 1 John. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Here's my ending statement. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Okay, and we need to remind each other who our daddies are. Oh, that's right. Our daddy is righteousness in the flesh. And I share in my daddy's spiritual DNA. I got to live inside of me. You remind me of your dad. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. If they're talking about our spiritual daddy, amen? Because we have been reborn of God. Let's stand together and pray.